the 100 year war rages on, but how did we get here? What's the media been hiding from us? Is this a genocide or a God given right? And who actually has a right to the land of Palestine? Our story begins in the late 1800s in the most powerful empire to ever exist, Great Britain, a home of patriots, Good morning, good. literature, not Slytherin. not Slytherin, eh? Better be Slytherin! And eloquence. You think you're sick, mate? I'll twang you daddy dick with a shot at me and fist bump you now! The British Empire dominated the world for almost half a millennium, and for an aspiring colonist, there was no greater ally. And during the height of the British Empire's power, Zionism, a movement advocating for a Jewish homeland in Palestine, was just setting its roots in the ground. There was one small issue though. People were already living in Palestine. More than half a million of them. And they weren't just about to pack their bags and leave. Theodore Herzl, the founder of the modern Zionist movement, knew Zionism needed help from other colonial powers. And they eventually got it, in 1917. Even if it was 13 years after Herzl's death. It was through Lord Balfour, a former Prime Minister of the Great Colony, that they got Britain's backing. He was also, ironically, extremely racist to the Jewish people. Lord Balfour, the very same guy who passed this declaration, really had the cojones in 1905 to deny Jews entry into Britain as they were fleeing ethnic massacres in Russia, labelling them as undesirable. Many go as far as to speculate that part of Balfour's reasoning to support Zionism was due to him being anti-Semitic, his ulterior motive being to get the Jewish people away out of Europe, like most of the European superpowers at the time. <laughs> so in 1917, as the ashes of World War I were beginning to set, Balfour signed off on the pivotal Balfour Declaration, marking the inception of a national home for Jews in Palestine, an inhumane document to say the least, detailing that the British had no intention even to go through consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants of Palestine, and Zionism be it right or wrong. Good or bad is of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. It was clear that Zionism for Britain was a business move, rather than a move of morality. And for the largest empire to ever exist, this was a chance to secure their stake in a Middle East that was ripe for the pickings. Who gonna stop me? Jesus. You're not stopping me! If we you see, at this point colonialism hadn't yet become distasteful, and in the beginning the Zionist movement was pridefully revered as the start of a new colony. As Zev Jabotinsky, the godfather of the revisionist Zionist movement would describe it himself, every native population in the world resists colonists as long as it has the slightest hope of being able to rid itself of the danger of being colonized. They will persist as long as there remains hope they will be able to prevent the transformation of Palestine into the land of Israel. In the years that followed, warfare continued between Zionist settlers and Palestinian resistance, both on the battlefield and in the courtroom. But soon the world would become preoccupied with the most fatal conflict in all of human history. World War II, and the Jews were in the thick of it. With the most detrimental event to the Jewish race, the Holocaust being among the tragedies that ensued, it became the quintessence of, and certainly the most notable, genocide ever. The end of the war saw the rise of the anti-colonialism movement, People were tired of power-hungry tyrants thrashing out to gather as much land as possible in the name of greed, at the cost of the well-being of their citizens. In Fortnite terms, Ninja went from being cool for destroying everyone to being a blue-haired lesbian tryhard. Because the youth of <laughs> Humanity desired peace, and for the British Empire this meant decolonizing, or risk being seen in the same light as Nazi Germany. This also meant finding somewhere to dump the mess they caused, that mess being Israel-Palestine. You pigeon-hearted pusillanimous weasel! Britain's withdrawal was anything but elegant. In short, Britain messed up, and now it was time for their older brother, the United Nations, to step in and fix everything. Unfortunately, cleaning up a war isn't the easiest thing. The UN eventually put the matter to a vote. In 1948, they ruled in favour to give most of the land of Palestine to the 33% Jewish minority, giving birth to the State of Israel. But the Zionists had no intention of honouring any partition. They wanted all of it. In a meeting of Jewish executives, Ben Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel himself, spoke about the partition merely being a stepping stone, so that Israel can become a legitimate state and have a state military, likely because states cannot be charged with terrorist acts. He admitted that after the partition was accepted, they would then demand from the Arabs that the Jews be allowed to settle, so that there is a Jewish majority within their own lands. If they did not agree, then they would use force. And sure enough, even before Israel had officially become a state, 
Heavily armed Zionist militant groups had already begun violently displacing native Palestinians. It's estimated that between 1947 and 1948 an unfathomable 750,000 Palestinians were forced to leave their homes, and that the lives of 13,000 were claimed by the Zionist state. This event was cemented in history as al nakba in Arabic, or in English, the catastrophe, and is ongoing to this day. What followed was more of the same. Israel would colonise and the Palestinians would resist. Many notable wars did occur after 1948, although since then the premise of the situation hasn't changed drastically. For the sake of keeping this video under an hour long, and if I'm being really, really honest, also because I'm weeks behind in school right now, I don't have the time to cover everything, so I'm just going to gloss over the most notable ones. In 1967, there was the Six Day War, in which, remarkably to their credit, Israeli forces gained control over the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, the Gaza Strip and West Bank from Palestine, and the Golan Heights from Syria, all in less than a week. The Yom Kippur War in 1973 was a secret attack launched by Egypt, which led them to gaining re-control of the Sinai Peninsula in subsequent years. In 1987, Hamas was established. He said it! He said it! followed by the first, second, and depending on who you ask, third intifadas, literally meaning to shake off in Arabic. These periods called intifadas marked points of major uprisings of Palestinian resistance against Israeli occupation. On October 7th, 2023, we saw the most recent great development of this century-long story. Hamas launched a surprise attack, a plan which had been in the works for almost a decade. They would storm the Israeli borders, killing around 1,200 Israelis, with about 800 of these being civilians. That day, Hamas would leave Israel with around 250 hostages. Subsequently, Israel declared war upon Hamas. And although not official yet, many consider the beginning of the Third Intifada to be marked by the events that occurred on October 7th, 2023. We interrupt this program for an important news announcement. You wake up when the alarm goes off. <laughs> you go to your job. <laughs> <laughs> Much like how this conflict has left the world divided, so too has it left the greatest protagonists and antagonists of Western media with a great chasm between them. Is the media actually biased like everyone says? I mean, how can you be biased if you're just presenting the facts, right? You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. Well, let's have a look at some of these statistics. Al Jazeera. A singular non-Western news organization mentions occupied territories more than every British and American news channel combined. In fact, across British broadcast channels, Israel's rights were insisted 1,482 times, while Palestine's were only insisted 278 times, 36% of those occasions being from Al Jazeera. It's actually stunning. The BBC insisted Israel's rights 81% of the time, while only 19% for Palestinian rights. Sky News were at 96% for Israel and 4% for Palestine, and almost laughably, Channel 4 and ITV were at 100% of Israel's rights to nil, not a single mention of Palestinian rights. In broadcasts, Israelis were 11 times more likely to be referred to with emotive language as victims of attacks compared to Palestinians. The list of examples goes on and on, which you can access in this report here. It's clear to see the evident negligence of Western media for Palestinian lives and Palestinian rights having little to no acknowledgement of the victims, statistics, or the violations against them. This has been going on a lot longer than you might think though. The Irgun was a Zionist paramilitary organization, which played a crucial role in the establishment of the State of Israel. It was founded by the man himself, Zeb Jabotinsky. On the 22nd of July 1946, the Irgun bombed the King David Hotel, the British headquarters in Palestine. Following the tragic loss of 91 lives, the event was labelled as a terrorist attack, and the Irgun, a terrorist organization. Ironically, however, the Irgun employed the same tactics as the modern-day Israeli Defense Forces. Some examples being assassinations, explosives, collateral damage, the killing of non-combatants, use of human shields, and a nationalist ideology. I would like to be a, a terrorist. When British lives were lost, Zionist forces were deemed terrorists, yet when it was the thousands upon thousands of Palestinian lives taken by a state, they had the right to defend themselves. The flaws are glaring in both the media's perception in the value of Palestinian lives and our international wars. From the wars in the media emerged many heroes, anti-heroes and villains, with some of the ugliest sides of people being broadcast live for the world to see. Why do, so, why do so many women become Muslim these days? Mm. Why do they so want many to be women oppressed? in the West? Is that what you're going to tell me? No, no. Why, why do so many they want to be oppressed? women in the world become Muslim? One thing is for certain. The media is hiding something from us. 
There's few sources that go unfiltered since there's no electricity or internet in Gaza, and what the news channels feed us has without a doubt been cherry picked. The story is far from finished, and the media, I'm sure, is buzzing to drop the next bombshell. But until then, I guess we will all be oblivious to the horrors that occur in the East. <laughs> What's the history behind all this? This actually goes back all the way to the biblical era. Once upon a time, Canaan, the grandson of Noah, yes, that Noah, settled in the area we know to be modern day Palestine. Many generations of his descendants followed, and these people would become known as the Canaanites. In coming years, the region was named after Canaan himself, and for more than 2000 years, the Canaanites prospered within their lands. Up until around 1200 BC, during the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites. By the way, modern day Israel and Israelites are two completely different things. Like how the Canaanites were the descendants of Canaan, the Israelites were the descendants of Israel, who was initially called Jacob or Yaqob in Arabic before his name was changed. He was a patriarch in Christianity and Judaism and a prophet in Islam. According to the biblical narrative, God promised the land of Canaan to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In other words, to the Jewish race. And the conquest of Canaan was seen as the fulfillment of this divine promise and part of God's plan for the Israelite people. Hence why many proclaim the establishment of a Zionist state to be a right bestowed upon the Jews directly by God. This isn't to say all Jews are Zionists and not all Zionists are Jews, with many if not most Orthodox Jews being against Zionism. You're not Jewish! Yeah, yeah. You're Zionist! Yeah, yeah. Zionist is against God! Us. The Israelites would succeed in their conquest and would genocide the Canaanites. They would thrive in the lands for about 1200 years, up until about 70 AD, when they would leave for the hope of a more prosperous home. Some argue that the Romans exiled the Jews from their own lands, but this is simply not true. The Romans never exiled anyone apart from enslaved prisoners, and as recently as 1929, Yitzhak Ben-Svi, the second president of Israel, and David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, both agreed that ancient Israelites continued to live on their lands under Roman rule. After the Jews left, Arab tribes would find their way into the land we know as Palestine, and would live there for about 1800 years, up until the issuance of the Balfour Declaration, and the rest is history. The Jews slash Israelites lived in the region for about 1200 years, after which the Arabs inhabited the lands for about 1800 years. When Zionism claims that the Jewish race is simply taking back their home, they're referring to a home they abandoned 2000 years ago. It certainly is a flawed argument on their side, and the claims that what we're seeing isn't a genocide are even more ridiculous. That people are bringing up the Holocaust. Do not use other genocides to describe this one. I have been... I... Oh. What's this? What's this? To deny Israel-Palestine is genocide would be the same as denying the Holocaust to be a genocide. Since there isn't really any consistent data before it, we'll look at the stats during the Israel-Hamas war. For every Hamas fighter killed, four civilians are killed. The total number of civilian deaths being around 24,000 as of March 2024, with more than 13,000 of these being children, or about 54%, in addition to almost 9,000 of these being women, around 37%. It's clear to see this isn't Israel against Hamas, it's Israel against all with Palestinian blood in their veins. If you really believe that the deaths of two children, one woman and one man for every Hamas fighter is fair, then I pity you. It draws similarities with what we saw in the Holocaust, with none being spared, woman or child. Blatant ethnic cleansing and it shows in its leaders and patrons. Exactly, okay. exactly. Do you believe, do you accept that Israel killed innocent uh, Palestinian children? I don't think they're innocent. Whoa. That's the thing, is I don't think they're innocent. Genocide literally means to kill a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying them. And if that's not what we're seeing here, then I don't know what is. I'm recording this on the 30th of March 2024. 38,865 days since the Balfour Declaration was published. And right now, Hamas is public enemy number one. We must condemn the acts of Hamas. It would be inhumane not to, but to inversely refuse condemning Israel is foolish and hypocritical. After 100 years of occupation and 17 years of deprivation of sustenance, electricity and resources, they were bound to bite back. Israel is turning Palestine into debris in a fierce blitzkrieg with no concern for civilian casualties.
with 600 years more history within the lands. There's a reason they're referred to as the occupied. And the right to the lands is undoubtedly to those who've known it to be home for almost 2,000 years. The very claim that all this is the occupier's self-defense is paradoxical within itself. You can't defend as the offense, and lies can't defend the truth from time. We will never know who or what lies beneath the rubble. But one thing is for certain. Time runs a thin fuse for the children of Gaza.